So thank you. Um, how to start this? Automotive from sheet metal to board shorts. This almost encapsulates my career to date. How does someone go from designing cars to designing board shorts? All with an engineering degree. And not just one engineering degree. I've got two engineering degrees and a commerce degree to throw into that. So, yes, again, how do I get involved in board shorts? This is me growing up. This is what I did Sunday afternoons. Well, I watched Ford versus Holden. Growing up, I was a Ford person. My dad was a Ford person. My grandfather was a Ford person. I watched engineers and racers over 50 years. This is the history of automotive sport in Australia. Over 50 years designing, building cars to race on Sunday so the automotive car companies can sell on Monday. We've probably heard that saying before. But the fundamental thing about it is competition. These are two car companies for the better part of the 19th century in Australia competing against each other, trying to get the best talent of Australia to become designers, to become engineers, to become material scientists, to become computer technicians, all driving technology. At its height, Holden had a 1,000 engineers and designers and spent a billion dollars, think about that, a billion dollars for a car that's predominantly sold only in this country. That's a lot of money and a lot of engineers to beat Ford. So I was uh, 23, just graduated university. Keep in mind, I'm a Ford person. Grew up as a Ford person. My first car was a Ford. Had rust, I think, from day one. It's a standard Australian trait. <laughs> my first job was with Holden. Much to the disappointment of my father and grandfather, I traded the blue shirt for a red shirt. So it's an interesting context, isn't it? Competing. Competition and rivalry drove for talent. Not saying I'm the greatest engineer, I'm just saying that I had a skill set they wanted. And I was in the height of that, you know, that five years where General Motors, when Holden had a thousand engineers, I was in that peak period. But I was working on Pontiac Project. And for those who know, who knows if Pontiac is still around today? It's not. I was working for a Pontiac Project for the US market, exporting our technology, our ideas to North America. Pontiac closed. I lost my job. So I was 24 and already got sacked for my first job. And I remember having this conversation going, what do I do now? First thing I did was picked up the phone and because Australia's got a small engineering community, rang Ford. Ford, do you have a job? They said yes. So two weeks after I got the sack from Holden, I went to Ford. So now I've traded for a blue shirt. Family's happy again. They're talking to me. It's, it's all good. But this got me thinking about competition. This got me thinking about rivalry and competing for best design practices, for best ideas, for the best talent. So this is how I got started in engineering, how I got started in mass manufacturing. Now, in Australia, we've got a challenge. Mass manufacturing is no longer a viable in industry. It's no longer a viable for career for thousands of kids who are studying engineering, science, design. Where do those kids go? So my question is, do we need today's equivalent of the automotive rivalry? What does that look like? And now take this to a global context. We've got generally in most industries two companies or two personalities that fight it out for innovation design. Apple versus Samsung. And if I took a poll roughly today on companies that you guys have in your pockets, so phone products, how many people got Apple versus how many people got Samsung? And there's a few punters that are still running around with a Windows phone, so I don't know what's <laughs> going on there. Okay, but let's talk about personalities. Steve Jobs versus Bill Gates. Elon Musk versus Richard Branson. Think about those people. They're driving competition. There's rivalry. And rivalry is friendly. It's not like, you know, beating up your brothers when you're 13-year-old and, you know, trying to beat each other, you know, down to the kitchen to see who gets the leftovers. So can Australia be the design and manufacturing revolution, the next revolution be sports design and technology? Think about that. How many world or Olympic champion athletes do we have? We're really good at sport as a nation. We've got so good at some sports that we have no right to be a part of. Surfing. We've got world champions. Mick Fanning, who's still with us, luckily. We've got... <laughs> 
We've got Sally Fitzgibbon, Steph Gilmore, you know, Tom Carroll, cycling, Richie Port, Cadell Evans. You know, we've got people who are competing at the top of their world. You know, we're a population of 23 million people competing against 6 billion, 6.5 billion across the world. Alpine sports. Now, here is a sport in Australia we have no right to compete in. We have eight weeks of snow a year, if we're lucky. Okay, but we have Tora Bright, we have Alex Chumpy Pullen, we have Alyssa Camplin, and swimming. Now, swimming's an interesting one. Most rural towns, most country towns in Australia have Olympic-sized 50-metre swimming pools. We have a culture of sports in this country. We have a culture in sports where towns of 50,000 people will have Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's pretty good technology to have. So, the world's sports technology engine. And there's a lot of flow and effects, and we'll talk about this, we'll come back to it. As I said, we're 23 million people. We have every environmental landscape. We have space, okay? And we have knowledge, we have ideas, we have people, and we have expertise in design, engineering, and manufacturing. Pretty key ingredients. So across my journey, I've been able to be involved in a lot of really cool projects. And I'm going to showcase some of the projects and some of the new ideas that we're coming up with here at Deakin and, and with my collaborative partners and how that affects sports technology and where we can take that. So we have the impacts of emerging science and technology. This is a fibre. It's 20 times thinner than a human hair. We can actually go 100 times thinner than human hair. So I want everyone to sort of grab your hair if you've got it. Me, I'm, I'm lacking a little bit. Think about if you went that 20 times thinner to 100 times thinner. Who would think they would actually feel that? That tactile sensation? You would, actually. It's quite amazing. The human body can perceive a lot of different things and feel a lot of different things. So not just visually, but tactile. So the number one purpose for this really small fibre is we embed this on high-performance textiles. That first high-performance textile product we're doing is hydrophobicity. Yes, I am plan on beating Gore-Tex next week. Okay. So this is an Australian patented technology developed in-house at Deakin. And now we've spun this out into a small company. Yeah. Very much fun. S small company, small start tech, uh, startup, but with Swiss-based capital. So that's an interesting thing. The good thing about the Swiss-based capital is it's run by an Australian guy who came back to Australia and saw our technology and thought, I can use that. We can develop world-class ideas, and not just one or two, but many. So that's the number one application, is, is that next-generation hydrophobic material. This is a five-year project to date. So I joined this project four years ago, um, and we've taken it further. The really great thing is the Australian government has now supported this project through financing for the next five years. I'm one of the few researchers that can say I've got five years guaranteed funding to develop technology. And the number one application for this technology is sports. Future methodologies, education, technology transfer. It's all well and good for me to work on stuff, you know. But how do we generate that 13-year-old kid who's watching motorsport today? What is that job that 13-year-old going to go? Even better yet, what is that job that that one-year-old child has been born literally 12 months ago? Where is he going to go or where is she going to go? What is the technology when they graduate? And you've got to think, I spent almost 10 years studying. It's a long time. So they're going to be 25, almost 30 by the time they get to an appropriate education level to develop new science and technology. How do we educate them? And how do we take those ideas from a lab out into industry? How do we showcase that to a company? Now, you guys are sitting in the new cadet engineering facility here at Deakin. This is the floor plan. And I said, this is all products I've designed. And I do consider architect, architecture a product. So I worked with architects, and they said to me, what would your ideal space look for? And I'm like, well, I want a design studio. I design stuff. I want prototyping facilities. And I want to be able to build things. So we come up with the product development triangle, design and interaction. And I please implore you guys to walk around at lunch and have a look at the labs and the facilities. Those fibres that I showed a couple of screens ago were actually produced with less than $5 worth of materials in the labs over there. So we're making multi-million dollar investment, making multi-million dollar companies with 
stuff that I can prototype in 20 minutes with $5. So think of the value add on that. Think of the scale up on that. So this, this institution, this place has all been designed to bring interaction. People inside the door and then ideas out the door. And then compound that with the university, then compound that with the country. So you have one small idea start here and then you grow it out. So we take in other technologies like carbon fibre, we take in the hospitals, we take in allied health. Then we take that out further to a country where we have space, manufacturing expertise and ideas. One of the final things is design, prototyping and storytelling. Now, I've been quite spoken about this in, in other forums, that I think we need to design better products. One of the reasons why I think we don't have a strong manufacturing sector at the moment is because people talk about advanced manufacturing. And that's a process, it's not an outcome. I think we need to design products that people actually want to buy. Why do you pay $1,000 for an iPhone? Why do you pay $700 for an Android? Interesting bait right there. But it's a product that you choose. It's a product that you spend your money on. So, board shorts. If you hear that phrase, and I think Richard Branson's been credited with it, was you fake it till you make it. So, I am a classically trained engineer. I know about steel. I know about titanium. I know about carbon fibre. What do I know about lycra? Well, funnily enough, again, I'm going to bring my parents back into this. My mother is a dressmaker by trade. So when I was 13, as well as watching motorsport, I got dragged into Spotlight in Lincraft and fabric shops all over Melbourne. I can tell you the difference between a wedding dress and a deb dress and a function dress. I can tell you the difference between a calf and a hen. Okay? So when you get a multinational come speak to you, go, oh, look, we've got this really cool idea on board shorts. What do you know about fabric and design? Like, yeah, I can do this well inside my wheelhouse. They're going, but you're an engineer. I said, yeah, don't stress. I've got it. But what we did, we went on the journey, and this is about four products that you see up on screen. We went on the journey together where we took advanced manufacturing, advanced technology, and we built wetsuits and board shorts. We 3D scanned people. We wanted to understand how do you build the ultimate wetsuit or the ultimate pair of board shorts. We did simulation. And just to let you know, I do sacrifice myself for my research. That is me surfing on the left-hand side. I know I get paid to surf. I get paid to go snowboarding. It's awesome. But also, I've been scanned. That's my leg in the top left-hand corner. And then I use that to do simulations on myself. So I can test a product before we actually even build it. And then I bring in designers. I bring in textile experts. I bring in companies to build better products. And now this is the really interesting part for me, is this intersection between those three circles. There's an opportunity for us to have. So it's not just about design, that's one part of it. We need to have great products. It's not just about technology, we need to have those great ideas. And it's not just about technology transfer. But there's an opportunity where we touch our products, we interact with our products. Whether it's a cotton t-shirt that you wear, or the wetsuit that you put on the go surfing, or the bike that you're using to beat your mate to the coffee shop. Someone's thought about that somewhere along the way. Someone's put technology into it, someone's put thought into it. My proposition is, what could Australia be? What could we do if we just stay advanced manufacturing? That's the process. What I'm saying is, what could we be if we have direction and vision? How many students, how many children can we then inspire to say, yes, I want to be the guy who designs the next snowboard that wins gold at the X Games? Or, now this is a really interesting one for me, is e-sports, e-gaming. This has been a phenomenon. And my wife's a school teacher, so I'm bringing all my family into this one. And she talks about these students as a game. And they are hardcore gamers. So when you think about these students who have now been brought up on the internet, they've been connected, and we've heard a bit about connectedness. But what they can do is visualise in a 3D environment exceptionally well. I don't teach how students to use CAD anymore. They know how to use CAD because they've been gaming since the age of 10. They can see a 3D environment. So the new world or the new Australia, what would that look like? And now I've deliberately left this slide blank because I think we're at a precipice in Australia where we can have some direction, have some focus, and then be able to launch that from sports technology to other technologies. Sports technology is a proving ground. Whether it's a carbon fibre snowboard where we test the stresses and strains and then understand how that material works and upscales it to aircraft or auto space. 
Or if we look at the, the rise of Paralympians, where we look at prosthetics and how they work on the test track, and then we launch out into allied health services, building prosthetics for kids, or building prosthetics for people who've had landmine injuries. It is the ultimate testing ground, because you're never going to punish a piece of equipment harder than you do on the sporting field, even football boots, even the human bodies they run into each other, whether we're trying to cool it or heat it up. So my vision going forward for Australia, for this university, is to pull, wholeheartedly put emphasis on sports technology to inspire that next generation who watch TV, who watch the EU Games or watch Red Bull Live and then say, yes, I can design a product. Not just be the athlete, but the person who supports the athlete. Thank you.